Good evening. I'm Tracy Ann Williams, the Director of Academic Affairs for the Bachelor's Program for Adults and Transfer Students. I'm also a faculty member who offers courses in African American Studies and Popular Culture. It is my pleasure, and on behalf of the New School, I'm delighted to welcome the New York Times and tonight's special guests back to the university. This is our 48th event with the New York Times since 2003. Our collaborations with Times Talks reflect the New School's dedication to addressing cultural and social issues and supporting creative expression in the arts, social sciences, and media. Now, to begin tonight's program, please welcome Tom Kulaga, the Executive Creative Director of Special Projects at the New York Times. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Tracy Ann. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Times Talks conversation with some of theater's most timely and directional voices. The acclaimed actors Kerry Washington and Stephen Pasquale, Tony Award winning Broadway and film director Kenny Leon, and playwright Christopher Demos Brown. Their new Broadway production, American Son, is a gripping tale set in a Florida police station as two parents search for their missing son. It bears witness to who we are as a nation and how we deal with family relationships, love, loss, and identity. Moderating tonight's event is New York Times investigative reporter, Nicole Hannah-Jones. She is the recipient of numerous national awards, including the Peabody, the George Polk, and the National Magazine Award. Last October, she was named a prestigious MacArthur Fellow for her reporting on school segregation. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our moderator, Nicole Hannah-Jones, and, and our special guests, Carrie Washington, Stephen Pasquale, Kenny Leon, and Christopher Demos Brown. Good evening. You guys seem really excited tonight. Can't imagine why. Uh, it's my great honor tonight to um, moderate this panel on what I haven't seen the play yet, but I read the script for it, uh, what I believe is going to be a very compelling and clearly timely play. And so uh, we appreciate you all coming out to, um, you know, on the last legs of the failing New York Times to. <laughs> Support, uh, support democracy and also talk about democracy tonight. So we appreciate it. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to begin by asking um, Chris, who wrote the play, to kind of tell us what the play is about since no one has had the opportunity to see it yet. Uh, well, thanks, Nicola, because I know I'm the person you want to hear from first. Uh, <laughs> the, the play is about um, uh, a couple, uh, played by Carrie and Steve, who are uh, summoned to a police station in the middle of the night because their teenage son uh, has had an, an encounter with the police, and the play kind of takes off from there. And it deals with uh, contemporary issues of race in America. Okay. You keep the answers that short, I'll get through all my questions. <laughs> I was told not to give anything away. <laughs> that, that does make it hard to talk about the play. Um, so I'm going to go next to Carrie. Um, so this is the first time that you've been back on Broadway in almost a decade. And um, I was reading from some of your press runs that you said when you saw the, the script, you couldn't put it down. I wondered if um, actually, you and then all of you can talk about what is it about your own personal background that drew you to this particular play? Oh, man. Um, a lot. <laughs> um, I, I felt like in a lot of ways I had never seen a character like Kendra, Ellis, Connor anywhere before. I'd never heard this particular voice of of African American womanness, um, and yet I knew her. She felt so real to me, so I wanted to breathe life into her. Um, <clears throat> 
But I also really identified with um, our son a lot when I read it. Um, and it just really made me feel like, I feel like the play is a journey into the fight for the soul of this country. You know, it's like we are grappling with how to love each other and coexist and survive, respect each other and listen to each other. And that's what these characters are doing throughout the play. And we get to kind of drop in and listen to four people from very, very, very different points of view be more courageous in their truth than most of us are in our everyday lives. And there's such value to that, for, in, in my opinion. So, Okay, and Steve, you play um, Carrie's estranged husband and also the father of this biracial child. Um, so can you talk about what drew you uh, to the play, and particularly what from your own life or experience drew you to it? trouble crossing that divide, how can people who don't even know each other at all cross that divide? So this spoke to me on a very deep level. Also, I think it's important to say, at what point is, is a play like this more important to do when we're talking about this than in this political climate and the racism in the White House? Your answer actually gets to a question I'm going to ask later. Oh. So when you hear it, there's no. <laughs> uh, he, <laughs> I paid my New York Times subscription. And, and we appreciate it. <laughs> and we appreciate all of you who pay your subscriptions. Um, so Chris, back to you. So you um, are a trial attorney in Miami. How did you come to write this particular play? And we were talking in the green room. You said you are inspired by uh, Ta-Nehisi. And the first page of your play is a quote by ta from his book, Race is the Child of Racism, Not the Father. So I wonder if you could talk about how you came to write this play. There were, when we were speaking in the, in, in, in the green room right before the show, it, it occurred to me uh, two days ago in rehearsal for the first time what what really prompted me to write the play, and, it, and I can't remember if it's from, from um, Ta-Nehisi Coates' book or if it's from one of his standalone essays, but there's a passage in it that really affected me profoundly. And it's a passage in which he talks about how ev after every uh, police shooting in this country, uh, each victim has an entire family and a community and cousins and mothers and fathers who have poured their lives and their hopes into this child. And that, that just, as for any parent, I think that's something uh, we can relate to. And uh, I've always felt that any person living in this country has an obligation to make some type of peace with this country's past, its racial past. And it's a racial past that began with slavery, continued with segregation, continued with, with uh, an official federal policy of stealing wealth from African Americans through redlining, continues today through, um, in addition to a, what I think is a militarized police uh, mentality in this country, um, through any number of subtle forms of racism. And as P any, any, person who wants to call themselves American, in my opinion, um, the, f the first measure of your patriotism is confronting that history. Um, so that's, that's kind of what, uh, I, that's, that's what, what I, I wrote from kind of a, 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 a gut rage when I wrote the play, and I wrote it really quickly, but um, and I, that, that's kind of a rambling answer to your question, Nicole, but that's kind of what prompted it. I like rambling answers. Uh, <laughs> So try to improve on the first one. I appreciate that. <laughs> Wait till the my next not, one. It's going to be so forever. Subtle hint. Um, so can, can you take me a little bit more, though, into that answer? So you, you read this passage. It's in between the world and me. And you're struck by that 
how do you go from that to saying, I actually want to write a play about a possible police killing or a possible police violence? Well, um, the, so you're asking me a, a, a process of playwriting question. Yes. Which, okay, I'm gonna try and keep you all awake for this. Uh, <laughs> the, so the, my, the, the commonality of process for me in writing a play usually is, as I say, I, something either irritates me or delights me or thrills me or, or in this case, it angers me. And I, start, I started, in this case, having imaginary conversations in my head in which I would put uh, people that I know with whom I vehemently disagree in the form of one character, people with whom I, I agree in the form of another character, and uh, just as a, a, a playwright, certain things instinct, instinctively work better than others. So by having a married couple um, involved in this dispute, as a writer a play, uh, for, for stage, you give yourself the tremendous advantage of having people who have a long history. You give yourself the ability to lay out exposition without having to make it clunky, hopefully. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how the process started. And but really, the play was written on the axis of, axis of this relationship. Great. Kenny, could you answer the same question? How did you come to connect to this play and decide that this was something that you wanted to direct? OK, shit. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, it may sound a little selfish at first, but um, I, I've done quite a few Broadway shows, and I sort of tie them all together. So if I look at, um, I had the opportunity and the blessing to have had, I had an opportunity to do um, Tupac's uh, Holly, if you, Holly If You Hear Me. So I was concerned about this country was not listening to young people and then a Raising in the Sun, and, and then last year, uh, Children of a Lesser God, which had to do with embracing the uh, deaf and hard of hearing community. So you flash forward to this, and Jeffrey Richards offered this play to me, and it continues like, okay, young people need to be heard. Um, I want to work with a writer that's, that has the skill set close to Lorraine Hansberry, and I want to keep reaching out to all of America so that we can get to that place to say we the people means all of the people and all of us have equal value. And this play seems to serve that and to remind us what it really is like to be in a really beautiful country when we live up to the beauty that we can be. And this particular play has four characters all different from each other and they look at the world all from different perspectives, but they're doing something that we did in Children of a Lesser God. They're listening. And if I can get all of America to sit in a dark room to look at four brilliant actors on a raised stage, listening to each other, talking about the country that we all wish we had and that is in our reach, then as a director, that's the most important thing to me. I get the opportunity to direct that play to have an opportunity to impact lives, to have a real impact on this country today. So Carrie, um, many people would say that all art is political, even if it's apolitical, that's actually making uh, a statement. Um, we are clearly in um, disturbing times and a time in our country where just a few years ago, many white Americans wanted to believe that we were post-racial, that having elected a black president meant we had solved everything. Um, and one thing clearly that the election of Donald Trump has shown is that these racial tensions were always bubbling under the surface um, and are now coming out in a much more open way. Can you talk about why this play, which really would be relevant in any period in American history. But why is it particularly important now? Uh, I, I mean, well, I, I echo your sentiment. I don't think there is a time when this play would not have been relevant. You know, I, I think 
the fear, and, and I speak as a mother now, you know, the fear that, that parents of color have about the safety of the bodies of our children, you know, that lives in my bloodline from the beginning, you know, from the moment we were brought to the Caribbean or to the United States, that fear of your child being ripped from you, literally sold down the river, which is where the phrase comes from, um, raped, persecuted, tortured, or maybe at best would have freedom because they would run from you and you would never see them again. Like that, that legacy is so deep in my DNA that there's not a time when I feel like this wouldn't have been relevant. Mm -hmm. But I think that the way these characters are grappling with the issues now, the way that the now is brought into the room makes it um, so raw and, and unavoidable. Like I just, every time, every day in rehearsal, I feel like we are kind of dropping into a nightmare that is our collective nightmare. Um, and there's something that, it, that it's a real privilege, I think, in a way, because there's a, there's a private trauma in families of color that if we can all own it, like Chris was saying, there could be healing there. Um, so the play is, is, is really about that fear, like that when, when you carry the DNA, the legacy of, of trauma, how does it impact your day-to-day -day expectations about what may or may not happen? And how do you navigate that on all sides? Yeah, and that's um, clearly a huge part of the play, right, is uh, the different frameworks through which the characters are seeing the exact same incident and the exact same histories and how the child should be raised are all through the very racialized and gendered experience of each of the and characters. And class as well. There's a lot of, mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk about class as, Absolutely. as well. I'll ask more about that in a second. <laughs> it's hard to like craft questions when you're not supposed to give a lot away. <laughs> um, but I, I wonder if, um, if Kenny and Chris, if you could talk about what does this play, which as Carrie and I just discussed, could have been put on 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, um, what does it say about the America that still remains? Um, what I would say is that the first part of the word entertainment is enter. And there should be doors and windows for all willing participants to enter to be inspired, to find humor, to find themselves in it. And I think this play does what all great theater does. It does allow us to laugh, to think, and to cry in one evening of theater. And unlike television and film, we sit there and breathe the same air as the performers do. And that's very exciting. You know, working on it now, I can imagine when the audiences get there, it'll be very exciting um, as well. So I think the play can work any time period. If, and my job as director, I mean, it's good to talk politics, but the play can't be political. It has to be an evening of theater. It must engage our minds, our heads, all of us. And then when we go home, I'm hoping like, oh, wow, what does this really mean? What does it make me want to do in everyday life? Can I add something to that? I think one of the things maybe that makes it particularly of today is this marriage, right? Like, because that's one thing that's different is that there were times w in this country where this marriage would have been illegal, right? There are times when this would not have been a consensual relationship that a biracial child was born of a white father and a black mother. So there is something today, very today, of these two people loving each other, choosing to enter this adventure of raising a young black boy together that is unique to today. You know, it is, it, it, it's, th that's something that I think really does place it in, in the nowness, is the, is the commitment to love, not to just coexist, right? Not just to like live in the same neighborhood or drink from the same water fountain, but to love and parent together. How does that raise the stakes and change the story? Um, and I do think, it's interesting, I, I do, I like, I love so much about this play and, and I love 
the humor that lives in the truth of the play. Um, but I would say, and this is a little bit in response to what Kenny said, like, I've learned, unfortunately, that even when all I'm committed to doing is entertainment, because I want to bring a full three-dimensional truth to my character, and because women and women of color are so marginalized, every time I stand in the center of a stage, it is a political act. Because I'm asking you to look at me. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to not ignore me and not tell me that people won't show up because I'm at the center of it, or people won't listen because I'm at the center of it. So I'm also great, you know, it's, it's like a, every day I just, I'm so grateful for, I know we use this word a lot, we use this word a lot that the country doesn't, but I'm so grateful for the allies, you know, to have a playwright like Chris who, who wanted to put a black woman and, and this interracial couple at the center of it and to, to have all of these actors come in and say like, we wanna tell this story about this couple. It just is very, like that's, that's how we find real truth in our communities is because we come together and we say, we the people means all of us, you know? So I know you're like way younger than me. I don't know about way. So. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I, I might certified. Got sabotaged by the CIA. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> um, but it was. I mean, nine years before I was born, it would have been illegal in you know, about 16 states for the union that is depicted in this play to exist. It's not ancient history, though often we do. And I think what this play does is it, it shows that both the father and the mother who are in a union and have created this child are both also still living with the legacy of, yeah. of the past when that would have been illegal and what made that illegal and the caste system that created that. And I wonder if you want to talk a bit about that, and, and how is that to play that role? It seems like a very intense role to play. Well, I mean, we've, we still have so far to come, I, I think, is what I end up feeling at the end of it. I mean, they talk a lot in the play about, they're a very metropolitan uh, couple and family, and they live in Miami, which is a hugely metropolitan area and entirely diverse, um, but it, that doesn't speak to the country as a whole. And so I think, um, the fact that they can't seem to oftentimes in the play get on the same page um, is an indication that we are really not even close yet to what feels like a post-racial uh, America. And that, you know, if, if deep historic love can't m make it feel like that, then, then what are we gonna need to do, you know? But there are a lot of things that we are on the same page about, yes. honey. <laughs> uh, yes, of course, dear. <laughs> there are things about them that work. Like, you do understand why oh, yes, we were course, married yeah. for so long, right? Yes, we talk... <laughs> <laughs> we talk often about... Carrie and I, before this uh, process happened, we talked about what this relationship must have been early in its inception. And it, ha it, it was probably amazing and interesting and filled with conversation and electricity and all these things that when you bring a, a biracial child into the mix, the, conver the conversation then becomes different and how to parent becomes different and slightly more challenging. And that's uh, sort of like where we're at in the in the middle of the of that of those trenches uh, in the play, and that's what's so interesting about it, I think. So, Kenny, the the play centers, I mean, it, it centers on this racial divide that is 400 years old, um, that's older than even our country, uh, and yet it's being told through this one family, and in this really this very short period of time, talk about kind of the, the challenges of making um, this long legacy of race and racism so intensely personal, but also just literally in such a small span of actual time that the play covers. Well, I'm actually just interpreting what's on the page. <laughs> and, and he's done a skillful job of making this a great story of suspense. So uh, you don't know what's gonna happen next. 
And even though they're a, a, a married couple going through things, they talk about universal things. They talk about things that will be interesting or challenging in almost every family. So the beauty of the script is that one minute we're talking about the first time we met, and the next minute we're talking about where's my son, and the next minute we're talking about do you still love me? And those are very human, everyday things, and that, I think that's the beauty of the I, I think the play is it's like um, it has the arc of Tally's folly, like 90 minutes, right on the button, you know, right on the button every night, no intermission. And it has the sort of the poetry or the, the beauty of writing of a Lorraine Hansberry play, and it has the emotional impact of Fences, August Wilson's Fences. So I put those three things together. I'm just going to drop and the mic high and go praise. home. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you can retire now, <laughs> man. No pressure. It's not going to get any better than this tonight, I'll tell you. <laughs> and I, I only have, uh, I have two wishes this fall. I have one wish is that in November, everybody gets out to vote. And my, my next, next wish is that we have long, long lines at the Booth Theater <laughs> waiting to come to see American Son. Also, just for context, uh, uh, the play, it does take place in real time in 90 minutes at a police station in Miami. So that's what she was referring to in terms of the whole evening takes place in one sort of moment. Can, can I go back to something you asked about a minute ago, Nicole? You asked why, why, why is the play relevant now? And something, uh, at least this occurs to me, there was a period not that long ago in our history when racism was overt, everybody, it was acceptable, and that was in, within my lifetime. Then there was a period that we, we've, most of the people in this room probably have lived through where you had a grandparent that would say racist things every now and then, but it was not generally acceptable. You kind of it really cringed when, when that relative or friend would, would act that way. And we felt like we were kind of improving. Then all of a sudden, that, that's become almost acceptable in parts of society again. And so a lot of what this couple is going through in the play uh, is sort of, th th there's a lot of subterranean racism that has, has all of a sudden bubbled up again. Uh, frankly, when I wrote the play, I, I didn't think it would be relevant for that long. And I, I um, hoped it wouldn't be, but you know, here we are. So that's actually um, <clears throat> great for the next question that I wanted to ask you, Steve. Um, what, what I love about your character is, uh, I think it, it represents really the more typical uh, way that white people deal with race. Um, it, we tend to not have a very nuanced view of race in this country, You're either in the Klan or your mother Teresa. Um, <clears throat> and of course, most people are in between. They, they believe in an egalitarian society, they believe in equality, they would say that they're not racially prejudiced, yet your character in the discussions even about what identity your own child should choose, um, who your child should hang with, what, whether or not your child needed to be protected from black culture, I think is really the way that race often plays out among white people. Um, so could you talk about <clears throat> how you can kind of play that role and what your thoughts were about it and, and did you recognize any of yourself in that character or people that you know who again are not, you know, they're, they're not the one at the, at the Trump rally, they're the ones in the audience perchance, but still hold these views. Well, and, and, and more progressive than that, he fell madly in love with a black woman. So clearly his ability to, you know, not have any, uh, what he thinks is bias uh, is, is enormous progress in his mind, and I think, you know, he, he represents to me a lot of white people who think they understand what non-white people go through or feel or care about. And what I take away from his experience is that we must defer always. White people must defer to non-white people when it comes to these issues because we do not have the right to not hear fully and completely that the other perspective. And um, he's like a fiery guy and an intense, Scott is the character I play. Um, but the thing I love so much about the play is that he makes a lot of good arguments mm -hmm. 
that can sound racist. And he also occasionally says racist things. And they are not the same. Um, and, and that fine line is really tricky. And I hope you don't hate Scott when you come. <laughs> you won't. But you know what I mean? It's a very, very fine line. Because you're right. It's so easy to dismiss everybody as a uh, somebody in the Klan or totally a post-racial, like, progressive New Yorker. You know right. what I mean? It's so great, though, also because I was thinking, like, oh, well, what if, what if Scott did think the way Steve does? Like, what if Scott... What if Scott could get that? And, well, then there'd be no play, because they'd just still be married and, like, <laughs> right. be super They'd be your boring. friends. They'd yeah. be your friends who are, like, yes. who, like, yes. know how to do it. That's you right. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's right. That was so much, like, personal friendship backstory that did not make any sense to any of you. I love the way you finish each other's sentences. It's I know, so right? cute. You know, it's like 19 years of marriage. <laughs> Chris, it looked like you wanted to say something and, and well, maybe expound on how you wrote that character and where you, where you drew that from. S Steve is um, is playing this role with a really wonderful, I don't even want to tell you because I don't want to mess you up. But um, it's so good, y'all. Sell it. <laughs> it's so good. The, I want to hear. The character, the character of Scott, <laughs> the, the character of Scott comes directly out of people that I've lived with and grown up with who would never think they have a, a, a racist or bias bone in their body. And in their defense, and in Scott's defense, Scott lives by virtues. And the, he lives by virtues, I believe, are universal virtues. And I think his wife in the play, I think Kendra, also believes there's a, there, the, the virtues that they both agree on are virtues. But that's, that's only the first step in understanding the... I guess the way I would characterize it is the incredible vulnerability that you walk through life with if you're an African American. It's there's there's a just a, a, a an, an assault, a constant assault against you, that's historical, that's immediate, that's uh, from from authority, uh, that that's economic, and that, so Scott's belief in virtues is is not a, is not going to get him all the way to appreciating w w the vulnerability that his wife is living with. Um, and that's what I hope the, the, the play gets at to some extent. Um, so. so it seems to me the, the play works very hard uh, to show that Jamal, despite his name being Jamal, is not like other black kids in a lot of ways, right? Like he doesn't have other black friends because he goes to an all white school. He, um, your character makes it clear that you didn't raise him to speak Ebonics. He listens to rock music, and this all comes out in the play. And I understand, um, or I'm assuming the point was to try to show that no matter what black people do, they can never not be black and experience what other black people face. But I wonder- Take that in, everybody yeah, take, take that, that in. Take that in, that is the truth, right? <laughs> take that in. It seemed, I mean, when I, was, when I was reading the script, in some ways I also felt bothered by making him into that type of character. Because, and I wrestled with this as a writer myself, is always looking for that perfect victim so white people won't find a reason to discriminate against right. this, this black person that you're writing about. So I wonder if there's a, it seems like a thin line between um, creating a character that shows that no matter what you do as a black person, you're gonna face certain things, but then also by doing that, um, almost reinforcing racial stereotypes of what causes black people to face certain things, right? It, I wonder if, like, did you wrestle with that? Because that's certainly something when I was reading the script that, that bothered me. Like, did, did he need to be that type of child to make this point? Well, I, um, I try to make it every character uh, like a snowflake, delicate and oh, one of a kind. <laughs> um, that's a and, loaded term these days. <laughs> Not that kind of snowflake. Um, and my hope is that Jamal is, uh, is, his, uh, is unique and has a, a couple of characteristics that kind of come out of the blue and surprise you a little bit. Um, and I, I, that, that's, that's, that's my hope. Um, I've, I guess I would need to know what specifically. Uh, I, I can help you out, yeah. my, my colleague. Thank you. And, um, 
It reminds me of something the great August Wilson said. He says, where were you when the page was blank? <laughs> I say that to say that the, he has, every play can't be every play. And he has four characters. And they all, and the other two actors are Eugene Lee, who plays uh, probably the opposite of what you would think a high-ranking police officer. His values are sort of interesting. And then you have uh, Jeremy Jordan, who plays a young cop who's just learning how to you know, live life as a police officer. But the thing is, those four people represent you know, who they are, but we talk about all the other stuff in between. So those issues that you're raising about that character being a certain way, C Carrie and uh, Stephen may have a conversation about that a aspect of the rest of America. So it's sort of hard to just, we're not trying to, I think Chris is not trying to show people anything in the play. He's just trying to create four people built around a certain situation and seeing what comes out of that situation that is you know, useful to us as we take it in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that on my editor when they ask me why I wrote something a certain way. So, <laughs> Where were you in the page? Where were you? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask <laughs> So thank you. Yeah. But <laughs> is, that. isn't that amazing, though? It's like people come to uh, plays, and they say, well, I didn't, like, I didn't like this, or I didn't like the way this guy wrote women, or I didn't like this. And it's like no one has a note about what you see until the writer puts it on on paper, and I think this is a time in America where to see a new play and a new plays, is, we, we've been seeing a lot of new musicals, but to see new plays, it reminds me of in the times when Death of a Salesman was a new play and A Raisin in the Sun was a new play, and to see that this guy is in that same army of presenting a new American play uh, about things that is going on in his head is pretty amazing to me. You know what, can I... Uh can I speak to what you were saying? Of course. I think that this, this couple make deliberate and loving and thoughtful decisions about providing the best opportunity for their mixed race child. And obviously in, in, a, in an America where we are not equal, those opportunities happen at private schools that are predominantly white in predominantly white neighborhoods. And so obviously, a lot of the play is about what he didn't get to experience as a young person in terms of his relating to other black people. But it is as much a conversation about economics and opportunity mm -hmm. as it is race. Is that, is that? No, I, I agree with you. I also think um, hidden in your question is a longing because I think the truth is, what happens when we don't have enough stories about young black men mm -hmm. is that we want every young black man to be every young black man, right? Like we don't, the, the real, the, the problem is like we don't have seven different examples about 18 year old African American boys. So when the play comes along, we wanna know why he can't be X or why he can't be Y and for us, you know, the universal is in the specific. This is one boy's journey, one young man's journey, and, and it was the journey that Chris wrote and the, the journey that Chris could access and could be honest about and that feels right to the world of our play. But I think if we had more of these stories about young men, then we wouldn't be so worried about the perpetuation of a stereotype because we would be constantly putting forward three-dimensional young black men and we wouldn't worry about that. Amen, you amen. <laughs> right. And I should also say, it's not a critique of the character, but I think when we, when we produce whatever works we produce, you want people to be discussing them and thinking yes. about them. Yeah. And if something makes you uncomfortable or if you're not sure why, to, like that, to me that, his character, who you never see in the play, is the most interesting because yeah. of that, right? Yeah. Because you're only seeing him through the eyes of other people, but also through society, so. You so badly uh, want to meet him, don't you? Sorry, you so ahead. badly want to meet him. Yes. The character of Jamal as you read the play. Which is right, and in the play he's going through this a transition, right, where now he is wanting to embrace more of his black side because of 
what happens in the parents' relationship. Um, but also, just as a, as a writer, when I think about craft and I think about the decisions, I, I definitely see my, like, um, I, I tweeted about this a few days ago, how as I'm writing my book, I very deliberately this time decided I will not find and write about the child who has done everything right. Mm -hmm. That the child who has not done everything right still deserves a good education, still deserves not to get yes. put over by the police. So I'm just conscious about those things as well. Um, so I want to get back to this question of, of what the relationship that your two characters plays kind of stands in for. Because again, as, as, as you guys see the play, you'll see that they're both seeing, um, you know, they're at a police station, they're not sure what's happened to their son, and they're both seeing all these experiences through their own racialized lens. It makes me think, and, and you kind of talked about um, this a little bit, Steve, that if two people who love each other and have a child together see the world so disparately when it comes to their race and how their child will go through this world, what hope is there for the rest of us? <laughs> well, they need more tools. I mean, on a on a personal level, what okay. I love about it is like I, I that's those are the friends we were talking about before. I have a couple that I'm very close to who remind me a lot of Scott and Kendra. If Scott and Kendra could have found a really great therapist, mm -hmm. you know, like like they're they're great people and they love each other very much, but their toolbox does not have the necessary framework to help them navigate the divide. And sometimes that divide is racial, but sometimes that divide is like they're they're not always nice to each other. You know what I mean? Like they're dealing with normal marital shit. And um and I think that they that part of, to me, part of what the play is, is an invitation. It's like an, an invitation into how do we do better. I don't think we're saying, like, it's not possible, but it's like we, we have some homework to do if we want to do it well, you know? Whether that's marriage or right. society in general, coexisting, loving each other, listening to each other. Did you have anything to add to that? Uh, you know, I would just say, you know, you're not going to, understand unless you invite people into your life that are that don't look like you so in my life there's a freedom I have a ton of non-white friends in my life so there is a freedom and a comfort to talk about race because the love and the trust is really the, the basis of it and I think there are a lot of people who aren't living that reality so hopefully if if anything the play would push you a little bit towards inviting a person into your life that doesn't look like you, and have a conversation. I mean, I actually think, um, uh, Chris, or that who looks like you but doesn't think like you, right. also. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. What, what, and I, I can't wait to actually see the play performed because I only read uh, words on paper. But on the one hand, you just you have you know two people who are in a strained relationship who once had great love and passion for each other and now do not. And on top of that, well, you, oh, well, they still do. Okay, sorry. I mean, look at that face. And I'm quite ready to let each other go, apparently. Um, but you know, we 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 have the sense that we can be colorblind and that love can conquer all. And I think you do a really great job with with not a ton of dialogue at showing that that's not enough, um, and that when you put this racial overlay over it, it just complicates it because all of the normal arguments that they would be having as a couple become even more intense because, oh, now you're saying, you know, um, a, a word that I think is racist or you're saying something that I think is racist. How did you come up with that dialogue? Do, like, do you know interracial couples who are having these issues or how did you come up with that? Well, I, I start with, with my own marriage, uh -huh. uh, which uh, actually is a really good, healthy, solid one. My wife's here tonight. And <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> and it's her birthday, um, so. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Stephanie, happy birthday to you. That's awesome. Yeah, so Stephen Pasquale saying happy birthday. Uh, 
Oh. Um, $165. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's in a premium seat. It might be more. She's got a really good seat. Yeah. Um, I also have a, a couple of very good friends who I interviewed extensively who are in uh, biracial marriages. Uh, two African-American women that I uh, worked with and have known for, for a long time. Carrie spoke with, with, with one of them. And they, uh, b both through just knowing them as friends and interviewing them as research for the play, uh, helped quite a bit, um, but a lot, a lot of a lot of the the issues you're talking about that that uh, are basic uh, issues that any any healthy marriage or unhealthy marriage has to confront um, that are complicated by race. I just kind of uh, picked up through observation and um, you know, a little bit of stagecraft. But it was very helpful to talk with 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 my two friends. And um, what was interesting about speaking with them was there were four or five things both of them told me that both of them had, had experienced that were virtually identical and completely independent of each other. So one, one example um, of, of this didn't make it into the play, sort of in, I, I incorporated it but not directly, is both of them told me um, that on multiple occasions they have been out with their husband when their children were small and were mistaken for their husband's nanny. Mm. Um, which, which I thought was interesting. And one of the ways that they negotiated through that is that uh, they, they're, they're, they discussed it with their husband, explained on, on one occasion, they're, they're, in one couple's case, the husband was not present when it happened um, and didn't hear the comment that was made, but they, you know, both, both of their husbands became very kind of um, sensitive to that kind of incident when, when their wives were affected. So um, that, that, that was particularly helpful to me, was to hear common uh, instances like this for, with both couples. Okay, um, so we are going to, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're going to go to audience Q&A. You can uh, come down, there will be microphones on either side. Just letting you know in advance, ask a question or I'll cut you off. Don't need to know your life story. Not here for you. Um, also, keep it actually short or I will also cut you off. And I've been told to instruct you, don't try to rush the stage and give anybody a hug, okay? All right. As long as we I have those who rules. who she's talking about. <laughs> You're good. As long as we have those, you know, rules, then we can we can all have a good night. I don't want to have to be anybody's bodyguards. Not what I'm getting paid to do. Um, <laughs> so, my last question is, you know, just a general question. When when people come to see this play, which I'm sure a lot of people will, um, what do you hope that they will take away from it, and particularly now? Um, in the moment that we're living in in our country? What, what do you hope that people will take from it? And if all of you could answer, I would appreciate it. I would. I want all 1,000 people every night <laughs> to take a breath with the performers on stage. That last breath, I want us all to take it together and I want us to move away from the theater and do s small acts that can make our world better. If that means talking to your neighbor that doesn't look like you, if that means calling a sister that you haven't talked to for 10 years, uh, yeah, and then go vote. <laughs> N Nicole, you, you write beautiful essays. I don't. Um, I write plays and my my goal is my belief is that a play is supposed to affect you in the gut not in the head so in spite of all this kind of uh, intellectual talk we've had tonight I hope that people uh, are hit emotionally very hard by the play and that they allow that emotion to connect with them in a way that then lets them sort through all the issues we're talking about um, I did a play with a guy named Ayad Akhtar, who's one of our great minds that we have working in the theater. And so I can't take credit for this, but he was telling me that there is 
a comprehensive science now, MIT, did a, many studies that says when people are viewing a piece of art together, when humans are viewing art together, music, theater, dance, whatever, their heartbeats sink. And that's real science. And it's the only opportunity we have in 2018 to get off our phones and stop buying shit and stop <laughs> watching television. And so if we can, if we can tell this, this story, which is going to ask you some hard questions about your life while your hearts sink together, um, that's all we can ask from, from my money. Just before, Ki before Carrie goes, can I say shit too since I'm the only one who hasn't gotten to say it? <laughs> I want to say shit. I want to be cool. I love you, Christopher Demos Brown. Um, I agree with all of that. And I also, um, I want to like take one step back and say I just want people to come. I know you said they will, and from your mouth to God's ears. But I, like theater's not cheap. And um, I want people to know that we are working very hard to make every penny worthwhile for you. And that um, if, that we're, we're, we're attempting to do something that is not just a play. We're attempting to like build community one night at a time by telling story that can unite our hearts and take us on a communal journey into ourselves. Um, so I just want you to come. I just want people to come. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I can't actually see where the microphones are. Are they out? They're coming. Okay, if you have a question, if you could please line up at the microphone. We have about 15 minutes, so we're gonna try to go through as many as possible, which means you must follow my instructions. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna start with you here on the left. Okay, hi, I'm, uh, my name is Bernice Sims, and I'm an author, and I'm also a veteran from the Civil Rights Movement in the South of Mississippi. I survived. My question, um, and it took me a long time to write a book about my personal experiences. My question is, I think, to the playwright. Writing this play, I'd like to know, or anyone can answer this, or performing in this play, did it deplete you in any way? Did it take something from you? Or did you, did you gain something? Or in order to gain something, did you lose something, a part of you? Did it deplete you in any way? That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it is, it's a wonderful question and qu quite the opposite. I, I, I have a very good friend who's a playwright who's, who describes playwriting this way, which I think is accurate. Um, I write to figure out what I think. And so I, in writing the play, I actually grew from it and learned a lot from, about myself and where my own biases are and where my own um, glories lie. Thank you. And since it didn't deplete you, if you are interested in another project, I'd love to talk to you about one. <laughs> okay, don't give us your mixtapes either. Uh, <laughs> all right, going with you on the right. Uh, hello. Uh, I did have the good fortune of seeing American Son in the Berkshires. And I thought it was exceptional and thought-provoking. But Chris, you are the only consistent person there was a different director and different actors. So I am wondering if you made any changes. Uh, you're also having a country and city audience. There were no black people in the audience, at least the night that I was there. In the Berkshires. Typical of the Berkshires. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, and, and I did see you as well in Bridges of Madison County. You were fabulous. But I'm just wondering if you did make any changes. Uh, I did. Oh, did you say that? I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I, I, made, I made quite a few changes. Uh, Carrie and Stephen in particular have a very good dramaturgical sense and were really helpful and really uh, pushed hard 
for things they believed in in the play and made it a better play. And I want to correct one thing you said. Julie Boyd at, 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 at Barrington Stage has a really aggressive community outreach and had lots of, of uh, Pittsfield has a large African American community and lots of African Americans saw the play up there. Um, and she, it's, she, she did do an outreach for the community for the uh, schools. I do yeah. know that. Um, and, and in the community, there was a, the, we, we had a play reading that had um, an, a, a community activist who brought, I think, about 150 people to the play. We had multiple talkbacks. So there, there was a, a very diverse community of people who saw it up there. Good. Thank you. To the left. I also saw it in the Berkshires. <laughs> <laughs> and it was wonderful, and that's why I'm here tonight. And Are you, you going to come again, though? Will you come see it again? I'm not sure. I think <laughs> You're not sure. Excuse me, the proper okay, answer to that question is yes. <laughs> the, if it was not changed, I'm not sure I would go see it a second time because it's so wonderful once, you already know what's going to happen. It it's has hard changed. To see it a Wrong time. answer again. <laughs> what's your question, sir? I what's your the, question? I heard the changes, I'll be there. Okay. My question is it's very timely today with. The president that we have and what's happening in America. When did you write this as compared to how things are today versus five, ten years ago whenever you wrote it? I, Thank I, you. I, I didn't write it that long ago. I wrote it in uh, early 2016, so it's, it's yeah, not that long ago. Okay. Thank you. All right, ma'am. We'll see you backstage, my friend, when you come. <laughs> Stevie Pasquale is going to rough you up just a little bit. I, I should say something about that as well. It's like we all know the ending of Hamlet and the ending of Richard III and Death of a Salesman. And um, our job as artists is to make that, that piece of art uh, relate to you now, impact you now. And he has written such a great play. There's room for many, many directors to direct this piece and still get a different evening in the theater. So I wasn't in the Berkshires, I've never seen the show. <laughs> but I have had the good fortune of being able to read it and I'm blown away by it. I think everybody should come and see it. My question actually is for Miss Washington, having had the benefit of playing Olivia Pope and Anita Hill. Who? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Someone, and speaking to the timeliness of the moment we are sitting in right now, Beverly Ford will be testifying tomorrow for the first time, taking Anita Hill's seat so many years later. If Olivia Pope got to have a conversation <laughs> with her tonight, what do you think she would say? Gauntlet laid. You know, I, I, I wouldn't, of the characters I've played, I wouldn't call on Olivia Pope in this moment. I would call on Anita Hill. Um, because, because it was a privilege to play her in the film confirmation. And I think she would offer more wisdom and experience because it, it sort of in reference to another question that was asked, she understands the cost of what's gonna happen tomorrow um, and the sacrifice that's already happened for her, that in coming forward, she has destroyed her anonymity for the sake of our democracy. So really, so really, I would say, I, would, I think either woman would say to her, thank you. And I think also the thing to know is that there's a great power right now in the truth that we are not alone. That we have to believe our survivors because when our survivors step forward, they are part of a great community. Um, so I would say thank you and you're not alone. Uh, yes, 
Okay. Oh, good evening. This question is for uh, Ms. Washington. It's mentioned that you haven't been on, on a, in a play in 10 years. The last play was also related to a race-related um, situation. Were there any differences or similarities when you approach um, this play compared to the last one? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. There, every play is so different. Every project is so different. Um, and I, I loved my experience of doing play, of doing race um, with David Mamet and that cast. Um, but this family that I'm in right now is it is it's an extraordinary experience. You know, I know one of the things I didn't know when I did race, I didn't. I, I just hadn't been part of the Scandal family. And what the Scandal family taught me was like what it really feels like over seven years to be in a community where you get to say the best words with the best people. And you don't always get that in this business. And so I know what that magic feels like. And, I, and in this rehearsal process, I am so grateful because I get to say and hear words that give me goosebumps and I get to look into the eyes of actors who I know are making me better just because I'm breathing with them in the same room. Um, and so I, I feel lucky. Like some actors only get that once in a lifetime and I'm getting it now and I'm so grateful. Thank you, thank you. Hi, my name is Shanna Jackson. I want to say that I enjoyed this whole panel. You all were great. Um, but my question is for Ms. Washington. Uh, I'm going to let you answer okay. that. <laughs> As she would. You can let him answer it if it's yes. I just want to know in your next, uh, in the next uh, part of your next phase of life, are you considering running for office? No. He's supposed to answer, and the answer's supposed to be yes. <laughs> Although she would make a great leader and politician, yeah, let me tell absolutely you. absolutely would. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, I'm currently a student at NYU, and I was wondering what advice would you give to young art and theater makers who are very distressed with the current political climate, but don't know how to reach the people who really need to hear it, whether that be the audience's willingness to enter, or accessibility to theater, or... Well, I, it, as, as bad as this political climate is, it's the best thing you can hope for as an artist. This is when you're most essential. This is when you have the most yeah. to say. Mm -hmm. You should be grateful for it. Mm -hmm. yeah, remember, is, history... Well, I think she's asking how, if, if I could... No, yeah. please. I, I would yeah. actually like to hear the answer to your question, because yeah. I think it's something I struggle with, too, is if you have a self-selecting audience, whether it's people who can pay for a ticket mm -hmm. or people who already have political leanings more in line with the play, mm -hmm. how do you reach those who either don't have the cost of entry or don't Not think that you have anything of interest to tell them? Yeah. That was the question? Yes, that okay. was the question. <laughs> that was the question. <laughs> I mean, create your own work. Make work that is small and affordable for people. You know, work in a venue that is really open to you know, the portion of the community that can't afford a $160 ticket, um, I would say. Yeah, it's like what I tell um, writers who don't know how to get their stuff in the world. And I say, you're, thinking of, you're trying to get to the last chapter without reading the first page. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say is like, write, and then invite your best friend over to hear it. Mm -hmm. And then invite the people from church to hear that and then keep growing that group. So you do little small things mm -hmm. and keep adding to that and eventually it'll get to the right, in the right universe. I just totally believe that. Thank you. But I think also let people know that you want it, right? Like, like for me, when we first started meeting about doing this and making this happen, I expressed it's important to me that we have tickets that are affordable to all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And so, and, it, you have like we have to speak that out and not be afraid and say like oh Broadway's not for everybody. We have to say no. I want Broadway to be for everybody. So how do we how do we adjust our budget so that there are tickets where people can come even if they can't pay for premium seating? So the more you speak that and say that's something that I want, mm -hmm. the more the people who make those decisions go oh is that something that you want to come to the theater? You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. like let people know. You want to make theater for everybody. You want it. Yeah. You know what I mean. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Thank you. Uh, next. Hi, this question is for everyone. Um, you spoke about meeting and talking with other biracial couples. Um, 
I'm the product of a biracial couple. I won't give you my life story because I'm a respectful. Okay, you saw me looking at you. Yep. (laughs) Um, But I will say growing up that my problem was I was always being told I was not black enough and my blackness was always being questioned. Um, And so I'd be interested to know if you spoke to anyone else who was the product of a biracial marriage or any kind of biracial relationship and what their input was. You're asking me. I'm asking anybody. (laughs) In in, in the course of researching the play, yes, I did. Um, And uh, not surprisingly, where, where I'm from and where I grew up, in Miami, there are lots of biracial people who are Hispanic, African American, uh, white African American, every combination you can think of, and, and um, their experiences were a lot of them not unlike yours, um, and and in a lot of different nuanced ways, uh, they they've dealt with it differently, and a lot of that worked its way into the play. So what's interesting in the question is. The uh, presumption is, of course, white people knew you weren't white enough, right? So the only concern is black people not thinking you're black enough. It wasn't even an option for white people to think you were white enough, right? Until it came time for them to need a black friend. Okay. (laughs) So I think that your question in itself says a lot about race in this country. Uh, Thank you. Y'all did so good. Look, we're actually going to get through all the questions. You and then you. Thank you. So I have two, if that's okay. But the first is for... Okay. um, You (laughs) You have one. (laughs) Okay. Just one. You got to (laughs) pick. You got one. For for Miss Washington, um, what advice do you have for young women entering the entertainment industry? Entering the entertainment industry? Yeah. Um, (laughs) Um... If there's anything else you want to (laughs) do, I would invite you to explore it. Um, And uh, I think just never forget who you are, never forget what you're worth, no matter what anybody says. And you're not an artist because somebody pays you to do it, you're an artist because you do it. Thank you. I I add a, a little bit to another question right before that, and we were talking about uh, going to the theater, and a Broadway theater can only hold 900, 1,000 people. So it's not always just about who has the money, who gets in. We're going to make every effort to make sure we have accessibility for everybody. Yeah. But then it's more than that. What I've learned as a director in the rehearsal, I'm listening to this woman talk every day, and she is giving power to, to women. And so if you're on the outside looking at that and the fact that she's on a Broadway stage giving giving voice for an African-American woman, you can take that and apply that to your life, you know? So after American Son is done and over with, the fact that we got an opportunity to tell this kind of story on a Broadway stage, then that means these stories are viable. And you can tell them in small towns in North Carolina and tell them in Atlanta, Georgia. But it's about more than just coming to the theater. So thank you. Thank you. All right, last question. Okay, I get to be the last one. I'll keep it very simple. Uh, My name is Lulu, and I'm a first year, second semester, Master of Science Media Management student at Parsons. So, yes, and I'm also the president of the Media by Women organization at school. So I was going to ask something similar, but I think I'll switch up my question. So in terms of self-care, when it came to this whole process, what was the best form for you, especially getting into this type of character? Um, this is for everybody. And for you, Nicole, as well. I love you, even with the journalism. Love it. <laughs> Self-care. Self-care. Self-care is essential. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> That's such a man answer. Such a dude. You need it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. It's true. <laughs> say I'm um I feel I'm gonna be honest with you there's a certain level of vulnerability for me in answering that question because I'm so in it Mm -hmm. that I'm really honestly daily Mm -hmm. (laughs) grappling with self with what self-care has to look like for me for the next few months 
um, it is a daily adventure. Uh -huh. um, so it is high on my list of priorities. I want to be of service to this character. Uh -huh. You know, I want to give her my everything, but I won't have a me to give her if I don't take care of myself. So yep. I believe in that whole oxygen mask thing. Uh -huh. um, so I'm, it's, a, it's a work in progress, ma'am. <laughs> Mine's bourbon. Now, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> um, it has been a tremendous honor to engage with you guys. You guys are, are so thoughtful. All of your answers were amazing. Um, I, your I questions really, were your amazing. Your questions were so good. Thank you, Nicole. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I can't wait to see the play. Um, I think it's going to be just so important right now. And thank you all for coming out tonight. And please give our uh, panelists your appreciation. Yeah.